Hello, I'm Martin Farr, co-chair of Insights Public Lectures. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the latest in our Insights Revisited series. We always try to have at least one big name in every programme, a person with a very high public profile. Often on television, radio, question time, any questions, start the week, very high profile person that everyone has a, a view about and engages and can engage with. And in August 2020, we hosted um, one of those people, George Monbiot, possibly our single most prominent environmentalist and activist over the last 20 years, um, very prominent campaigner, who was speaking as it was then in the middle of the Brexit crisis and after 10 years of what was called austerity. And he gave a, as we'd hoped, a highly provocative, stimulating lecture to a packed house uh, without a note, uh, a brilliant performance, uh, whether or not one chose to agree with what was being said as an experience, it was exactly what we'd hoped for in a public lecture. And we hope very much that you enjoy his talk, Out of the Wreckage, A New Politics for an Age of Crisis. Liz, and thank you everyone for coming. As Theresa May would say, it's great to be back in Durham. <laughs> now, one of the questions I'm most often asked is, why don't I despair? How do I get up in the morning, given that my job basically consists of rolling in the excrement of humanity? And the truth is that, yeah, sometimes I do. After all, there's quite a lot to despair about at the moment. I mean, let's start with where everything should start and nothing ever does, which is our environmental crisis. One of my more disturbing revelations um, in the last couple of years is that climate breakdown, and I call it climate breakdown because calling it climate change is like calling an invading army unexpected visitors. <laughs> Such a ridiculously neutral and passive term for this existential crisis. But climate breakdown is not even the most immediate and urgent of our environmental crises. When you look at the incredible cascading collapse of ecosystems, of biological diversity and abundance, it's happening even faster than climate breakdown is happening. Of course, the, things are, the, the two things are interconnected, but the primary driver in, 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 in the case of ecosystem and, and biological collapse is the food industry. 
principally meat and fish. And its clearance of vast areas of land and sea of the great majority of wild life forms at extraordinary speed. Uh, people, some people are very concerned about the growth in the human population. And I say, well, yes, there is a population crisis, all right. And it massively outweighs the growth in, in, of, of human population, which is growing at about 1.2% uh, a year. It's a livestock population, growing at 2.4% a year. At current rates, there'll be 120 million tons of extra human beings on Earth in 2050, and 400 million tons of extra livestock. This, more than any other factor, is trashing the living planet, which is why we don't talk about it. So that's crisis number one. And that crisis is uh, exacerbated, but also contributes to crisis number two, massive global and national inequality with marginalization, exclusion, accompanied very often by misogyny, racism, the politics of reaction arising from this incredibly divided society we're creating, where basically we're returning to a 19th century oligarchy in, in some respect, with a small number of people grabbing just about everything for themselves and leaving less and less for the people of these generations, let alone <coughs> on future generations. And that crisis, in turn, exacerbates and to some extent spawns a third crisis, which is the political crisis. Effectively, the shutting down of political space for any but a very narrow set of views, which are principally those purchased by the oligarchs through their networks of fake think tanks, of purchased academic departments, of newspapers, and most newspapers are owned by billionaires, and surprise, surprise, they represent the views and interests of billionaires. Um, through uh, the advisors placed in government, the secondments into government, and before very long, uh, the ministers working for government, many of whom belong to the same oligarchic class or are in effect their servants. And what has happened uh, during the era of oligarchic control is that politics itself has become almost illegitimate. It's almost been declared as a disqualified activity. Because the thrust of um, the ideology that they have sponsored, which is best described as it was by the original formulators of this ideology, as neoliberalism, is that the only legitimate forum for decision-making is what they call the market, which is really their way of saying money. It's money which should be allowed to decide. And hey, lo and behold, if it's money that's allowed to, to decide, those with the most money have the most votes. You can see why from the very beginning, well, from 1947 with the formation of the Mont Pelerin Society, inspired by um, Friedrich Hayek's book, the road to serfdom, uh, which really kicked off the international aspect of neoliberalism, you can see why some of the world's richest people immediately flocked to this idea and started sponsoring it massively. The creation of an international network of think tanks primarily, but also academic departments, set up to promote the ideas of Hayek, of Ludwig von Mises, later of Milton Friedman, and a whole network of thinkers who were promoting this notion that society should be treated as if it were a market. And human relations should be essentially transactional, and that through buying and selling, and this is a critical point of neoliberalism, we discern a natural hierarchy of winners and losers. And those at the top of the hierarchy in a supposedly free market are those who deserve to be at the top. They are the deserving rich, while those at the bottom deserve to be at the bottom. They are the undeserving poor. This is the essence of neoliberalism. There are no structural factors admitted. So if, for example, you don't have a job, it's not because of structural unemployment, because that does not exist. 
Structural unemployment is a concept which neoliberals reject and say it's, it's simply been invented by, 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 by pinkos. It's because you are lazy and unenterprising. And if your credit card is maxed out, it's not because of the impossible costs of housing, it's because you are feckless and reckless. And if your children are obese, it's not because of the junk food and it's backed by the massive advertising and marketing industry uh, that employs the best neurologists and uh, the best neuroscientists rather and psychologists to find ways of breaking down our resistance. No, it's because you're a bad parent. And, and all the structural forces are dismissed to create this idea that if you are having a tough time, it is your fault. If you're at the bottom of the socio-economic hierarchy, it is your fault. And if you're at the top, it is entirely through your virtues. And anything which interferes with the discovery of this supposed skull and nature, this natural hierarchy, is an illegitimate intrusion into the only legitimate forum, which is the market. That includes taxation, regulation, trade unions, NGOs. In fact, it comes to include politics itself. Because politics itself tries to change social and economic outcomes by something other than transactional buying and selling relationships between people. It includes, as Margaret Thatcher, a, a, a very true blue neoliberal, pointed out, society. Because society is an intrusion upon the pure market. And social structures are an intrusion upon the discernment of merit through buying and selling. So social structures themselves must be dismissed. And because of the constraints that neoliberalism imposes upon politics, gradually rolling back the state, it's a self-hating state controlled by neoliberals, tears itself apart uh, because it basically says there is no means of solving our problems except through individual striving. We cannot create any social means of solving those problems. We cannot create any collective means of solving those problems. It massively exacerbates the two former crises, the economic crisis and the environmental crisis. Uh, both of which would be bad enough, but neoliberalism has, has accelerated and to some extent created. So we face these interlocking crises, which are really one and the same, which is the reason why... Um, though I try to talk to everyone, as I become older, I go further and further to the left because I begin to see that we're basically facing the impacts of an oligarchy when we're faced with all three crises. Some people call me a watermelon. They say, you're green on the outside and red on the inside. And I say, no, I'm an apple. I'm red and green on the outside. Um, and these, this is an intersectional crisis. These, these, these are absolutely meshed together. And the racism and the sexism, of which we see more and more, are embedded in those crises as well. And that the whole notion is that we should not contest, we should not act, we should not protest, we should passively accept our fate and blame ourselves when things go wrong for us. And we begin to accept and, and internalize this ideology, this way of thinking. So just as people like Donald Trump congratulate themselves for becoming so wealthy, which means congratulating himself for having the father that he had, <laughs> the poor blame themselves for becoming so poor. Because they're constantly told by the newspapers and constantly told by the fake think tanks, the dark money funded lobby groups who are on the airwaves all the time. In fact, there's one on question time right now, about an hour's time. Um, because they are constantly told that they're to blame, people accept that blame. And what we see is that the crisis of alienation caused by those first three factors feeds into a further crisis of psychic rupture. And we can list this as crisis number four of a real collapse 
in mental health for very large numbers of people, particularly now for young people. Huge, huge levels of self-harm, of, of, of um, uh, social anxiety disorders, of the disorders of, of alienation and loneliness. Loneliness with these devastating impacts on human well-being, not just on our psychological well-being, but also on our physical well-being. Some research suggesting that it is twice as bad for you as obesity. It's, twice as, it's as harmful to your physical health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And here we are in a world of 7 billion people with a large number of those people with no one whom they can call a friend. This is an extraordinary situation. It's not an inevitable situation. It's a situation that has been thrust upon us. And the oligarchs sit at the center of it. The good news is that, as the name suggests, there aren't very many of them. <laughs> which makes it kind of remarkable that we've allowed them to get away with it for so long. So facing these four crises, why don't I despair? I mean, I've made what seems to be a fairly coherent case for despair. <laughs> and the reason is that I see political failure as being at heart a failure of imagination. If you're staring at the wall and you cannot see the cracks in it, and I'm not talking about that particular one, because, um, I don't want to alarm anyone. Um, it's not because there are no cracks in the wall. It's because you are not looking at it right. In every political wall, however monolithic and huge and terrifying it might seem, there are cracks. And you need to stand back. You need to change the angle of view in order to see them, and they will become apparent. And this conviction, born of decades of political involvement, has been heightened for me by four observations over the past few years, made with the help of others. The first is perhaps the least original, but it's still useful, I think, it's still interesting. And this is that when we try to make sense of the world, we do so not through facts and figures, not the sort of sense that a mathematician would recognize, or a scientist, or a philosopher, but through stories. We are primarily creatures of narrative. The story is the shortcut, the heuristic, that allows us to understand the world. And this has been the case for a very, very long time, and the reason is quite simple, that the world is simply too complicated to make any other kind of sense of. The streams of data coming at us would completely overwhelm us if we tried to assess them all and weigh them against each other and make sense of the balance between the facts and the figures with which we are surrounded. So we don't do it like that. We listen for the sense that we see as narrative sense. We listen for a story which makes sense of it all, which tells us where we are, how we got here, and where we are going. Ideally one with a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And because of that, this now very well-attested view of how humans make sense of the world, it is not either facts or figures or political leaders or political parties which really make political change. It is stories, big political narratives. When um, John Maynard Keynes sat down following the Great Depression, and tried to make sense of the world, and wrote his general theory, he wrote a story, a very powerful story, a story so powerful that by the time it really kicked in, late 1940s, everyone <coughs> almost became a Keynesian. Richard Nixon is alleged to have said at one point, we are all Keynesians now. It didn't matter whether you called yourself a Democrat or a Republican. Labour or Conservative. Your history became irrelevant. Your colour became irrelevant. You were a Keynesian. It became the common sense that everyone accepted. It was the story that everybody told about how we're going to get ourselves out of this mess, 
um, following these, uh, these prescriptions that Keynes laid out in narrative form. It's a very effectively told story. Then, when Keynesianism ran into trouble in the late 1970s, for reasons we can go into if you like, uh, later on, the neoliberals came forward with their story that they'd spent the past 30 years cultivating, going back to um, the road to serfdom um, and, and forward through this massive network of think tanks refining it and refining it and refining it until they got the essence of it. And uh, they came forward and, and said, look, here's a whole new story. And before very long, because of the trouble that uh, the Keynesian social democracy got into, more and more people adopted this until, again, it didn't matter what your political colour was, whether you were Labour, Conservative, Democrat, Republican, you all became effectively neoliberal. Clinton, Blair were <coughs> neoliberal premiers. And this is not surprising in view of our narrative sense. If you try to confront a powerful story with facts and figures, however untrue the story might be, and however accurate the facts and figures might be, they will simply bounce off. I found this during the climate wars, and I gave up after a while, but I spent three years of my life fighting climate science deniers. And, um, and, I, and they would say, ah, it's all a big conspiracy. These climate scientists are only in it to make money. Because as we all know, the way to get rich is to be a climate scientist. <laughs> Far quicker route to wealth than, say, being an oil company executive. Um, and, and so what they're trying to do is create a global new world order by frightening us about this thing they've made up called climate change. And therefore, um, uh, they're going to um, tax us and control us and um, something and something and something. But anyway, it's all a big conspiracy. And you say, well, um, actually, that's not true. Because if you look at this paper in geophysical research, <laughs> it's, and it's, just, it's hopeless. It's absolutely hopeless. You know, they'll spend, they'll spend 30 minutes coming up with some crazy new idea, explaining why the world's warming and it's got nothing to do with us. You then spend a week deconstructing that idea. And by the time you've deconstructed it, they've made a completely other claim, <laughs> which totally contradicts the first one. And, and you're sort of left holding this massive pile of data which proves they're wrong, and you've got nowhere. And you realise they're not remotely interested in the data. It's completely irrelevant. The only thing that counts for them, and amongst the very large numbers of people they managed to lure into it, they're kind of declining again now, but it became a really big thing, was the story that they told, which resonated with certain people. You cannot take away someone's story without giving them a new one. The only thing that can replace a story is a story. And this led me to a second observation, which is slightly more interesting. That when you look at Keynesianism, and when you look at neoliberalism, and when you look at Marxism, and when you look at communism, and when you look at just about every ism there has ever been that has got any traction, that has been a successful political story, and when you look at Christianity, and when you look at Islam, and when you look at Buddhism, and when you look at the great majority of religions which have taken off successfully, you find that not only do they all tell a story, they all tell a story with the same narrative structure. This is where it gets really interesting. Now, as we know, there are three basic plots, or five, or seven, or nine. There's always an odd number, I don't know, but uh, people will argue endlessly about how many basic plots there are. But there's a sort of general agreement that there is a certain number of basic plots. But there is one which recurs again and again in religion and politics. And it doesn't matter what side you're on, what you're trying to promote, the ones that win are the ones that follow this particular structure. And it's a structure I call the restoration story. And it goes like this. Disorder afflicts the land, caused by powerful and nefarious forces 
working against the interests of humanity. But the hero, or heroes, confronts those powerful and nefarious forces against the odds, overthrows them, and restores order to the land. It's the Lord of the Rings story, it's the Narnia story, it's the Harry Potter story, it's the Bible story. It's endless, endless, endless stories, but it is also the Keynesian story, also the neoliberal story, also, also about any successful political ideology. They've got that as their central narrative. And you just plug in the particular elements, what the disorder is, what the land is, who the powerful and nefarious forces are, who the hero is, how they confront the powerful and nefarious forces, um, and what the order is that they restore to the land. It's different in all cases, but you just plug those elements in. Quite a, an extraordinary thing when you look at how, quite subconsciously and unwittingly, we've been doing this for thousands of years, basically telling the same, well, the same narrative structure to tell completely different stories about where, where we are, how we got here, and where we are going. Which leads me to the third observation. That the reason, despite its manifest and evident failure, particularly in 2008, exemplified by the financial crash, but right across society through social dysfunction, through environmental dysfunction, through political dysfunction, we are stuck with neoliberalism, is that we have produced no new restoration story with which to replace it. After the Great Depression, Keynes wrote his general theory and said, here's the answer. And people said, oh, thank goodness, there's an answer. When that ran into trouble in the 1970s, neoliberals came forward and said, here's the answer. We've got this new story. Oh, thank goodness, there's a new story. When neoliberalism completely fell apart in 2008, we came forward and said, um, well, that wasn't a very good idea, was it? Um, we're against it. We're against it. We, we didn't even have a name for it. We didn't even know what we were against. We were so naive, so, so dumb about what we were facing that we couldn't even identify the problem, let alone produce the narrative solution. So we said, um, well, maybe we have a little bit less of that. Or some people say, no, no, we need far more of it. It didn't go far enough. Osborne and Cameron, for example. Um, and, or well, maybe, how about if we went back to Keynesianism? We could go back to that. Well, there's several reasons why that's not going to work. One, it's very hard to go back in politics, unless you're a fascist. For some reason, fascists <laughs> seem to be, keep being able to reinter, uh, disinter the same ideas. I don't know how they do it. But, um, but other people struggle to do that, you know, and it's like, oh, that's what Dad believed. Why should, you know, I don't, I don't want to go, go there. Um, but um, number two, the conditions that allowed Keynesianism have been systematically closed down with the destruction of capital controls, the destruction of foreign exchange controls. Um, it, to, to some extent, it was flying on one wing from the very beginning because Keynes's proposal for an international clearing union and an international trading currency, the Bancor, were killed at Bretton Woods, which meant that basically there was always going to be disruptive trouble ahead for Keynesianism. But without capital controls and without foreign exchange controls, you, the levers you might pull of economic stimulus just don't work anymore. Classic example was when the government in 2008, in response to the financial crisis said, let's stimulate the economy through scrappage fees. We'll pay people to scrap their cars and buy new ones. And this will be um, great for the car industry and that will create employment, classic Keynesian solution, and it will um, somehow magically solve the environmental crisis. They all got a bit hazy at that point. <laughs> um, and so they said, right, here's 350 million pounds. Whoa, spend this money, buy, buy yourself a new car. And they did. The only problem is that 85% of our cars come from abroad. So this was a fantastic, uh, very generous allocation of foreign aid to Germany and Japan. <laughs> Without the capital controls, you couldn't ensure that it had its effect within our national borders. And of course, there are the state aid, aid, aid laws and all the rest of it. And the idea that you know, we can dismantle that whole thing and start again with Keynesianism, well, even if you could, they learnt how to destroy it the first time round. They've already got that full toolkit. They won't have forgotten. 
They know how to pull down the capital controls and the foreign exchange controls. But there's an even bigger problem here. Because at the heart of Keynesianism is the notion of sustaining a steady rate of economic growth. Through stimulus spending, but also through dampening, if it goes too wild, that bit always got forgotten. But um, the idea was that you spend money into the economy um, in a classic Keynesian fashion, um, and, and, you, um, and you stimulate uh, consumption, which stimulates employment. And that's great. That makes perfect sense, and would continue to make perfect sense if the planet were also growing. Unfortunately, we live on a finite planet. And continued growth on a finite planet means that we crash through planetary boundaries. We're already crashing through planetary boundaries, left, right, and center. But at 3% growth rates, which is what they're always aiming for, that means the economy doubles in 24 years. Well, uh, let's have a look at this. We're already using far too much of everything. You want to double that? Oh, wait a minute, then it doubles again in another... 24 years. So within 48 years, we're using four times as much as everything. How can that possibly work? Oh, decoupling, they say. We de decoupling. Well, material resource decoupling, absolute decoupling, has never happened. And is already, the relative material resource decoupling is very close to its physical limits. You just, it just does not happen. There might be a slight relative improvement. It's going to be no absolute decoupling. It just does not happen. It's never happened. It never will happen. Basically, even if you emphasize the knowledge economy, the service economy, what do people do with the money they make from them? Oh, yes, they buy a flight to Thailand for their holidays. Or that nice new car they always wanted. It, it feeds straight back into the material economy. And this has been demonstrated again and again. So it's just not going to work in the 21st century. We need a new story, a new restoration story, a story that tells us uh, where we are, how we got here, where we're going, a story that makes sense to people, a story that grabs people's imagination, a story that, um, uh, that is based, in this case, unlike neoliberalism, on real facts in which realities are embedded as opposed to fables, fairy tales are embedded, the kind that Hayek and, and von Mises told. So it sounds like a tall order. But I believe there is such a story waiting to be told. And the great thing is that when we know the narrative structure, as I say, all you need to do is to slot the bits in. So one possible story. Well, let me tell you two possible stories to show how you can use this narrative structure in different ways. Um, just by way of example. And the second one will be the one I'll focus on here. But you can quite easily use the first one, or indeed variants on the theme. So we start with disorder afflicts the land. Okay, so what's the disorder? Climate breakdown. Let's say climate breakdown or environmental breakdown generally afflicts, and what's the land? The whole planet. Climate breakdown afflicts the planet. Caused by powerful and nefarious forces working against the interests of humanity. Who are the powerful and nefarious forces? the global oligarchy, who have basically captured huge amounts of, of our um, wealth and are hell-bent on ripping down regulations and taxation so they can rip the rest of our natural wealth to, to shreds. Uh, working against the interests of humanity, well, yes, that's us, and, um, and we see how they're doing it, let alone what they're going to do to subsequent generations. But the heroes of the story, who might the heroes of the story be? Yes, we are the heroes of the story. The heroes of the story confront these powerful and nefarious forces. How? Well, maybe through Extinction Rebellion, for example. And, and as it happens this very evening, here in this very city, there is an Extinction Rebellion meeting, I believe at 7.30, which is slightly unfortunate. But, um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, it, 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 it's happening here and now. We confront these powerful and nefarious forces and against the odds, overthrow them and restore order to the land. Well, what would that mean? That would mean leaving fossil fuels in the ground, getting livestock off the land, um, switching to a, an economy based on uh, uh, using only the resources we can afford to use 
and allowing future generations to be as prosperous and have as, as much well-being as we and past generations have had. Um, and, and that land, again, we're restoring it that the order to is the planet. So you can see how um, you can, it doesn't really matter what your story is, you can plug it into the narrative structure and in doing so, talk to people in ways that we've found it very difficult to do so before. But the particular use of this structure I, I, I want to deploy this evening is slightly different, though it overlaps considerably with the story I've just told. And this is disorder afflicts the land. Well, I've actually described the disorder of this sort of neoliberal social and psychological rupture which has been taking place, accompanied by environmental, political, economic dislocation, all feeding into alienation, which contributes to that psychic rupture. The land, in this case, let's talk about the UK, but we could talk about many other places as well. Everywhere is really suffering from this, but with UK politics, we can plug this straight in. Disorder of, of this sort of alienation afflicts the United Kingdom, caused by powerful and nefarious forces working against the good of humanity. Well, these powerful and nefarious forces, I think we all know who they are. <laughs> uh, these are um, you know, these tremendously rich people who have effectively bought politics and effectively shut down the opportunity to change social outcomes. But the heroes of the story, and guess who that is again? Yes, it's us, we are the heroes of the story once more. Um, confront these powerful and nefarious forces through creating a new politics that I call the politics of belonging. And by rebuilding community, both actual geographic community, but also political community along the lines of, of new models being developed at the moment, we confront those powerful and nefarious forces against the odds, overthrow them, and restore order to the land. Order being society, being the creation once more of thick, intertwined networks of human beings acting as social creatures above anything else and changing social outcomes to meet our own needs. That's it in a nutshell, but it might need a little bit of unpacking. So I'll do it by way of example, because I can't give you a comprehensive view, as I would be here for night after night if I were to attempt that. But I'll try to condense this into a few steps and a few examples in each step of how we might go about this task. And I believe that a critical component, necessary but by no means sufficient, is to create the sense that we are once more working as community. What they have done is to atomize and rule. When Thatcher told us there was no such thing as society, that was her manifesto. She wanted there to be no such thing as society because atomized people working alone can be kicked around till kingdom come. Whereas a, a community of people cooperating, working together, is far too strong for anybody to kick around if it is functioning, if it works well. And I believe, though it's quite unfashionable in leftist circles, that community is something which works best at home. And we tend to be rather scared of the notion of community and geographic belonging because of the way it's been captured, particularly by the fascists, who think of an exclusive and cruel community um, of people who look just like them, of people with the same skin colour, the same belief system, and everybody else must be excluded. But the alternative to an exclusive and cruel community is not no community, because we just can't do that. When we try to live as they tell us we should live, when we try to live these alienated, atomised lives of soul traders and lone rangers and self-made men and women, we fall apart. We can't cope. We stand together or we fall apart. Uh, the psychic rupture becomes overwhelming. And so people constantly seek community, which is why fascism is taking off again. Hannah Arendt pointed out that it's lonely people who are drawn to fascism. Because what fascism 
offers you is a highly coherent community. You all wear the same uniforms, you all march to the same music, if you can call it music, you all do the same salutes, you all chant the same slogans. It could not be more coherent. And when people have, have been atomized, they are looking for coherence, they're looking for a sense of belonging, and fascism offers this. The only way you can confront that cruel and, and exclusive belonging is with an inclusive and generous belonging. Very interesting that community and belonging are about the only two terms that cross the political divide. You can mention it to anyone, and hardly anyone would say, oh, community, belonging, Ugh. No, I don't want any of that. Thomas Paine and Edmund Burke, they could not have been more different. They hated each other's guts, but they wrote almost identical statements about how politics should grow out of community. Because these are as fundamental to our well-being as food and drink and shelter. They are absolutely essential to our very humanity. And so if we're going to be effective, we have to build communities that work for people. And while this is a nice thing in its own right, it's also an urgent priority, because if we don't do this, the fascists will do it instead. And they're already doing it very effectively. But we need to build, yes, geographically based communities, but in which anyone who's there, even if only for a short period, even if it's only for three months, feels that they can belong, feels a sense of belonging, a sense that they are part, full participants in this community. And the great thing is that there's almost a science now of how this is best done. Collated in this massive report, 400-page report, written by Tessie Britton and others for Lambeth Borough Council, where they looked all around the world at how to create a participatory culture, where it has worked, where it has failed, what lessons can be learned from this. And they come up with several guidelines. So to give you an example... Um, they, they say you've got to have a mixture of the sort of deep and committed community activities, which sort of quite specialist people do, and what they call low threshold, <coughs> low commitment activities. Things that anyone can drift into and drift out of without feeling that they've got a huge step to climb over in order to get there. Because it can be a bit scary when we've been set apart from each other for so long to think, talk to those people and do things with them. And a very good example is eating together. How many people know the etymology of the word companion? That's about average, thank you. Oh, yes, one. Very good. <laughs> and you're not even English. <laughs> is, it the same in, is it the same in Dutch? Yes. You're from Rome. Yes, exactly. Companions with bread. This is fundamental to fellowship, is eating together. And what do we do? We sit in front of the telly with a microwave meal. Um, and, and, you know, you'll probably all watch these separate tellies as well, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not the way to do it. And, and, and there's wonderful initiatives like the Big Lunch, which last year got 18 million people together on one day to eat together in their streets, in, in, in their communities. You know, you close off the street or you find that uh, it, 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 very... Uh, very unusual possibility that it might rain, you might find an indoor space, but where um, you, you put all the tables together and everyone brings something to eat and you eat together. Simple. Cooking together, mending together, shared child care. Um, there's this whole suite of activities which you can engage in which start to build what Tessie Britton calls thick, thick networks. And a thick network <laughs> is what happens when you get 10 to 15% of the community engaged in participatory activities, you suddenly get this takeoff where it becomes the norm to be involved and it becomes unusual not to be involved. You know how most people go along with the status quo, whatever it might be. And it only takes, and this, we see this throughout politics and, uh, and, and economic discussion as well, it only takes about 10% of people to shift and suddenly the status quo is perceived to have shifted and people go along with it. And we see this sort of take off, for example, in Rotterdam, where I was just the other day, um, looking at this classic example, which Tessie mentions in the report, um, uh, uh, which is a, an old Turkish bathhouse called the Leis Al, which means uh, the reading room or the library. 
And um, when it was left derelict, and the city council started shutting down all the public libraries, some local people took it over and turned it into a library. A quite unusual one where people donate books and you can just take books. There's no signing out or anything. Um, but there's also a cafe in it and a bar. And a, a in the old uh, bath area, this beautiful auditorium. It's a sort of natural auditorium where you have films and lectures and plays and stuff. And loads of people started flocking to this. And then people said, well, wait a minute, we need a crash, And we need outreach for older people who can't get out of their homes. And suddenly, all these new social initiatives started developing. And it was part of a great wave which really swept over Rotterdam in which 1,300 new community groups were developed. And it's completely transformed the life of the city. What you saw there was thick networking happening. And the city council now consults the community groups before it does anything because it realises they've managed to transform things in a way that we never did. And I think that that creation of deep community, of thick networking, of participatory culture, is in effect the seedbed which allows a lot of other things to happen and also allows them to put down deep roots so they can't easily be ripped up and, and, and we get atomized once more. We quite deliberately and consciously build community at the local level. And the lovely thing about it is you don't have to ask anyone's permission to start. You don't have to go through a party structure. You don't have to um, have endless meetings to decide whether it's going to be done. You just start putting leaflets through people's doors. Or talk to your Facebook group and get something going. The other lovely thing about it is that every step along the way is pleasant. You get to the end of your life and say, oh, we didn't change society. All I did <coughs> was... Um, uh, bring people together and get them talking to each other and making stuff together and eating stuff together and looking after their children together. And um, yeah, okay, we sort of just created a network of society locally, but we've still got the same bad politics. No step is wasted. Every single step is a good step which builds a better society. There's no, none of that nasty old leftist rhetoric of means and ends. Yes, we have to do some bad things in order to get to the good things, you do good things to get to the good things. You build as you mean to go on. But that's just the first of the conditions. As I say, necessary but not sufficient. The second is to build alongside that, because I'm not saying, not doing this chronologically, because all of these things can begin to happen at the same time. In fact, I believe should begin to happen at the same time. The second step in terms of my schema, rather than in terms of um, any temporal structure, the second step is, uh, 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 is, is to start digging in for participatory politics. Now, I'm not suggesting we replace representative politics. I think representative democracy still has an important role to play. But we supplement it with participatory democracy. Because after all, isn't it ridiculous that we stick just to a representative system, a system that allows the Prime Minister to say, well, sorry, mate, you elected me three years ago, so I'm allowed to do this. And you say, well, first of all, I didn't elect you. <laughs> and secondly, even if I did elect you, it wasn't to do this. It was for something completely different. In fact, this wasn't even in your manifesto. You say, well, I'm the democratically elected government of this country, so I can do it. It's absurd, the idea that one cross you did or did not put on a piece of paper three years ago, four years ago, enables them to do something which nobody voted for? There might be 170 items in the manifesto. How many people would have read it? Hardly any. Everyone was voting for two or three of them and ignoring all the rest of it, but everything in that manifesto. You voted for it, therefore you have approved it. It's this presumed consent. We don't accept it in sex. Why should we accept it in politics? <laughs> Quite remarkable. So, just like good sex, it should be participatory. <laughs> and the, um, a really great example of this is what's going on in Reykjavik. Because, as you know, in Reykjavik, they got hit very hard by the financial crisis. And unlike us, they said, as a result, we're going to do things a bit differently around here. Perhaps they're a little bit more grown up in Iceland. 
Um, and Reykjavik is where the great majority of the population of Iceland lives. Uh, and it had been run basically by the banksters and their friends. And so um, with the Pirate Party and others, they decided, you know, we're going to look at how we could run this city on a completely different basis. And so they um, um, have created this system where anybody can put forward an idea for the improvement of the city. And then everybody else can vote on that idea. And the ideas that come top of the ballot every month are put forward to the city council. And the city council either has to accept them or to produce a very good reason for rejecting them. And it turns out that that very good reason is absolutely essential to trust in the system. Because when you feel that your idea is being rejected out of hand, as I'm sure anybody who's put forward an idea in this political system feels, you just lose faith in it. You think, well, that's a total waste of time. They've got nothing to do with me. It's just yabber, isn't it? It's talking above our heads, which is how then the anti-politics brigade, the, 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 the fascists and, and others, get a foothold because politicians let people down. But when you have to explain very carefully all your decisions, people think, OK, I didn't win this time, but I could win in this system. I could get my idea through because this system is a responsive system. And it works so well that two-thirds of the population of Reykjavik have participated in the system. And they have transformed the nature of the city. Um, it's, it's physically different, it's socially different, politically different, economically different. It's really made an enormous change. And there's a, a sense of ownership and trust that wasn't there before, which again feeds back into the sense of creating cohesive community. Ownership and trust, <laughs> sense of belonging, are absolutely crucial to effective community, but also, I would argue, to effective politics, which is why I call it the politics of belonging. But that's just step two. <coughs> step three is to do something similar with economics. And what we're talking about in this case is participatory budgeting. And this was pioneered in the Brazilian city of Porto Alegre. Sadly fallen now, like much of Brazil, but for a few years was tremendously successful. And the idea was that uh, the people of the city set the infrastructure budget. Porto Alegre, like many Brazilian cities, had been beset by corruption, by clientelism, by the mafia. And basically, this infrastructure budget, which was meant to benefit the people of the city, just got nicked. And those bits of it which were spent tend to be spent on the richer parts of the city because they were the ones with the political power. And so you have terrible rates of infant mortality, appalling sanitation, and um, sewerage, uh, shocking um, education, uh, terrible transport. It was just a highly dysfunctional city. But with participatory budgeting, everything began to change. And they had this very clever system. I explained the, the details of the book, but the, the, the system basically uh, allowed uh, as many people as wanted to participate, 50,000 people a year set the budget, including illiterate people, the poorest of the poor, actively involved, in fact, disproportionately involved in it. And they had a clever formula so that uh, even though this was a sort of one person, one vote, there was also a formula for ensuring that money was transferred from richer areas to poorer areas. And it just wiped out corruption, clientelism, and the mafia almost overnight. Quite remarkable. All the indicators went through the ceiling. The infant mortality collapsed. The maternal health massively improved. The water quality massively improved, sewerage, transport, everything. It was quite extraordinary what it did when you looked at the indicators by comparison to other Brazilian cities. Um, and, and, and something happened that political scientists will tell you is simply impossible. People started demonstrating in the streets to have their taxes raised. Seriously. <laughs> What do we want? More taxation. When do we want it now? Seriously, this is what people would do. What, why would that be? Why would it be? Well, if you look at transport, for example, Porto Alegre, like many Brazilian cities, are terrible gridlock tra traffic jams, um, and you, the poor lived a long way from their place of work. So what do you do? Well, you can save up all your money, and you can spend $3,000 on buying yourself a car, and you get stuck in the same traffic jam as everyone else, and you've... You might get there a bit quicker than if you were walking, but not a lot quicker. 
So you're still stuck with this highly dysfunctional transport system. Or you could be taxed $200 in order to create a monorail system or a trolley bus system and to create dedicated lanes for them to travel. And hey, presto, you're moving three times as fast as you were before, you're getting to work on time, and you've spent a tiny fraction of the money you would have spent trying to solve your own problem. And in fact, when it is spent properly, public spending just gives you so much more wealth for the same amount of money than private spending does. And in fact, when you look at um, the world as a whole, you see that only a very small number of people will ever be able to afford private luxury because there's just simply not enough physical or ecological space. If everyone in Newcastle had their own tennis court and swimming pool, Newcastle would be the size of London. London would be the size of England, and then there'd be no Newcastle. <laughs> see? See what a fixed private luxury bit city is? But there's plenty of space for public luxury. You can have wonderful municipal swimming pools and tennis courts, and art galleries and everything else, which allows everybody, wonderful parks, playgrounds, allows everybody to have a high quality of civic life without taking away space from anyone. This is, you know, so this leads me to a formula which I've started to use a fair bit, which is private sufficiency, public luxury, as a sort of slogan for the way I would like to see economics going. So um, participatory budgeting, I believe that this is a model which can be applied. In fact, in many places around the world, it is being applied, though not as much as it could be, to infrastructure budgets everywhere. I think it can um, not just be confined to the infrastructure budget. There might be other aspects of municipal budgeting it could apply to. And I think it should not just be confined to the city level. There's no reason why it can't be applied at the national level too. What Porto Alegre showed was that very, very large numbers of people can participate as long as it's done in a clever way in a way which, which enables them to feed their voices up through a system which, which still respects their decisions while collating those decisions into coherent politics. Uh, and, and there's no reason why that can't be done at the national level. So you see, gradually by creating a, a, a geographical community, a political community, and an economic community, we're beginning to change the political nature of the land. But still, that's not enough. So there's a fourth element I would like to introduce, and that is shifting economic power and wealth out of private hands and towards the commons. Now, how many people could comfortably define the commons? Zero is average. Don't give yourselves a hard time. It's quite remarkable. It's the commons was... Pro was until just a couple of hundred years ago, our primary economic sector. And yet we hardly discuss it at all. When we position ourselves politically, <coughs> we position ourselves between, uh, well, well, along one axis, between the market at one end and the state at the other. And if you're on the right, you say you want more market. Why is this the left hand? It's wrong. <laughs> if you're on the right, you say I want more market and less state. And if you're on the left, you say I want less market and more state. Yeah? And we sort of move ourselves up and down. And we have these completely sterile debates as a result. But there are actually four sectors of the economy, four primary sectors. The market and the state, and they can both have their role. The household, crucial. Some people call it the core economy, because without it, nothing else can function. There's a lovely book by Catherine Marcel called Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? <laughs> and it turns out that while the great man was writing The Wealth of Nations, his long-suffering mother, Margaret Douglas, was doing all the actual work. And she was feeding him and making his bed and cleaning his clothes and all the other things which allowed him to write The Wealth of Nations. But of course, he completely ignores this crucial economic role while he's writing the book. The hands of his mother remained invisible. And, um, and so... The core economy, we ignore that, the household. But then there's a commons which we ignore even more. Commons, what's the commons? Well, the commons typically consists of three elements. It's a particular community. 
It's not a general open access thing. It's not like ransacking the oceans or just putting your car onto the street. This is a particular community which controls and manages a particular resource. It could be a piece of land, it could be a river, it could be a forest, it could be some software, it could be a web platform, uh, it could be a community <laughs> broadband system, and all these other things I don't understand. Um, but it's a particular resource controlled by a particular community. And the third element is the rules and negotiations that community creates in order to control that resource. The commons, a, a true commons has several um, distinct characteristics. Number one, it is inalienable. It can't be sold or given away. Number two, either the product or the resource itself is divided among its members on an equal basis. This isn't communism and this isn't capitalism. The commons exists in a, is an economic sphere of its own. And it's the sphere, I believe, which unlocks many of the changes that I would like to see. So to give you one example, and it's just a sort of crude way of putting it, by way of example, and there's much more subtle ways of doing this, but just as a description of what you can start to, what could be the economic imaginary of the, of the commons, but then can begin to be put into practice in various subtler forms. Let's imagine that we impose a high rate of land value tax. That this extraordinary situation where certain people claim to own large tracts of valuable land and charge the rest of us a kind of private tax for using it without having to do anything. I know someone who pays 50% of her income. She has three jobs. She works like an ant all day long. 50% of that income goes to her landlord who lives on a beach. I kid you not, he lives on a beach. And he just hangs out all day. He doesn't have to do any work at all because she is working on his behalf. Why? Because he owns this patch of land which has got some bricks and mortar on. The land is worth about 70% of the value. 70% of the rent she ha it, that's extracted from her pocket is paid because he claims to own this piece of land whose value has been entirely socially created. The, the, the lights, the sewerage, the streets, the businesses all around have all been created by society and all give that land its value. As a famous anarchist and radical Winston Churchill once pointed out. <laughs> He's a great proponent of land value tax, believe it or not. And, the, um, and, and so you impose a rate of land value tax high enough to have several interesting effects. One, to bring down the value of land to the private owner. Because if you can pocket all the rent you can take and all the increments, the planning gain, you can capture it all for yourself, then that land is going to have a much higher market value than if that wealth is socially shared. So you're straight away bringing down the price of land, making it more available um, for other potential uses. Secondly, you have a blinking great pile of money in your hand. It's always very useful if you're a government. And you say, uh, right, well, what should we do with this money? Well, there's all sorts of things you can do. But one thing you can do is to say, let's use this money to purchase land for other purposes, for social purposes. We can, for instance, fund community land trusts to buy land for themselves and build um, their own uh, um, housing estates, their own communities, <coughs> on the lines that they choose. Maybe to design not just the houses, but the whole estate. And when you do that, all sorts of extraordinary things happen. Much better things than when you have some volume house builder helicoptering down their standard design, regardless of who might live there and who might want to live there. You have um, a, uh, um, uh, the possibility of creating community-controlled amenities. Again, strengthening that sense of ownership and belonging in the local community. Now, of course, you have to be careful that it doesn't become exclusive, and so there have to be various mechanisms for ensuring that everybody has their voice and everybody along the commons principles has equal control. So you start to create commons out of areas that were previously privately owned. 
So that's the sort of four elements of building a politics of belonging that I see as all feeding into each other and contributing to each other. But all of these, so far, are at the local level. And while I believe the local level is crucially important, because democracy works much better at the local level than anywhere else, because you've got a much better chance of engaging with each other and engaging with the people who claim to represent you, obviously we also have to operate at the national level. Because everything we might attempt to do at the local level can be destroyed by hostile politics at the national level. So what we need is regime change. <laughs> Democratic, of course. And how do you bring this about? Well, the answer lies, I believe, in some things that happened in the first half of 2016. You're scratching your head. What possible good thing happened in the first half <laughs> of 2016? Well... It was the Bernie Sanders campaign to become the Democratic nominee for President of the United States. It's very interesting what happened there, because <laughs> Sanders started from a place which you really don't want to be in if you want to be President of the United States. He had 3% name recognition and he had no money. <laughs> Bit of a problem. And so he and um, the small number of people around him sat down and said, well, yeah, what are we going to do? What have we got? And some bright sparks said, well, the only thing we've got is the enthusiasm of people who want you to be president. Well, great, yeah, okay, lots of people want me to be president, but there's only a small number of them. What do we do with that? Ah, <coughs> what if we were to start giving them some of the jobs that staff would normally do? Instead of going to Goldman Sachs and getting a huge amount of money so we can employ, employ lots of staff, what if we were to give those jobs to volunteers? Oh, they'd never do them. I mean, you know, it's hard enough getting people to stuff envelopes. You want them to do big jobs. You want them to organise the meetings. You want to organise the phone banks, get the volunteers to do an organisational thing. Why would they want to do that? Well, let's try it. Uh, uh, volunteers, we were just wondering if possibly you might want to organise... Oh, yeah, we'll have that. We'll do that. Yeah, come on. Oh, wait a minute. Quickly, they began to discover that the more you ask people to do, the more enthusiastic people are to do it. If you ask them to do a small task, they'll do it grudgingly. If you ask them to do something really big, they'll do it with delight. Because meaning and purpose and utility, these are things we all want. We all want to feel useful. We all want to feel that we're making a difference. And when you give people that opportunity, they snatch it from your hand. They desperately want to do it. So they began training up volunteers. And then one of the volunteers said, wait a minute, why are you training us? He said, well, what do you mean? We need to train you. No, 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 you don't. We will train the next wave of volunteers. Because we know the business already. We've seen enough. Just leave it to us. Oh, oh, God, a bit scary. But anyway, first wave trains the second wave. Second wave trains the third wave. Third wave trains the fourth wave. By the time the nominations closed, there were 100,000 volunteers working for Sanders doing what staffers would normally do. They discovered that four or five volunteers basically equals one staffer, and you've got some resilience there, because if one person drops out, other people could fill the gap. And they'd organized 100,000 meetings of volunteers and spoken directly to 75 million Americans, and spoken as members of their own community, not some bloke in a suit with a clipboard who's, who's saying, uh, right, well, we're in, uh, is it Newcastle? Um, Right, your problems are, you know, but it's like, yeah, your problems are my problems. You know, I live just down the road. I've been sacked from the same company. Those bastards did, did it to me, too. You're so much more powerful. Tragically, they only really cracked the model in the last four weeks of the campaign. They just suddenly found out how to do it. It went absolutely berserk. It was quite extraordinary. Sanders' poll ratings were sort of doing this. Sort of slow but steady rise, and suddenly... You could see the inflection point where they cracked the model. They just went, Vroom. And they reckoned, with three or four more weeks, the rate that was snowballing, they would have spoken to every accessible adult in America. Direct, one-to-one -one conversations. And then I believe there's nothing which would have prevented Sanders from becoming <coughs> the nominee, and nothing which would have prevented him from beating Trump, because they would have kept that going. Now, I read a book uh, by two of the Sanders organizers called Rules for Revolutionaries. 
which explained these techniques. So I was fascinated by this. And just after I read it, Theresa May called the election. So I thought, whoa, this is interesting. What if, what if they did something like this over here? So I made this video for The Guardian. And this was at a time when the only debate was within The Guardian, and indeed, in fairness, within society as a whole, was, are the Conservatives going to win a majority of 100 or 120? <laughs> and so I made this video saying, look, look if, if Labour were to adopt these big organising techniques, they could possibly swing this. And you know how you should never look below the line, the comments? Uh, I've got this sort of fatal attraction, you know, you just can't help them draw, drawn to it. And every time, oh, God, why did I do that? You know, it's like eating that extra chocolate bar. Oh, no, I knew it was going to be bad for me. And, 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 and in this case, there wasn't a single favourable comment. Everyone was saying, you've totally lost it now, Monty. We always knew you were a wrong one, and this has proved it. <laughs> totally looped the loop. And, and I read those and thought, oh, God, why did I make that video talking about wishful thinking? What an idiot. Of course, of course, the Tories are going to wipe them out. Little did I know, this had nothing to do with me, let alone with my silly video. Little did I know, even as I was making the video, two Sanders organisers were flying over to advise the Corbyn team on big organising. And they spoke to the momentum activists, and they spoke to the labour grassroots, and they applied the same stuff in six weeks. The result, the biggest political surprise in British democratic history. Still didn't win, but they came very close from a standing start. Other success stories, you bet there are. Because after <coughs> the Sanders campaign, some of the organisers who got, became a bit disaffected with Bernie because... He didn't really get it. He sort of went along with it, but he is a bit 1970s in his outlook, and he sort of kept trying to re-centralise and stuff and didn't quite understand how revolutionary this was. Some of them decided, well, let's go in alone. And they formed this group called the Justice Democrats, and they went around the country looking for inspiring and remarkable new candidates. Um, people who never put themselves forward for politics, which in their view was a qualification, um, uh, but people who just had um, currency within their community, some of them community organisers, all of whom had, were doing shitty jobs to make ends meet, were living in bad accommodation, were basically facing the problems that so many working class Americans face. So people who lived it, who didn't just talk about it, but lived it. And they found lots of people, but most of them said, well, look, who are you guys? You know, am I really going to devote a year or two of my life for campaigning for this when I haven't got the institutional backup and you're just, just a bunch of hippies? Why, why should I believe you? But a few went for it. And among them, among the people they found was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ayanna Presley, and several others of the Congress people who have just been elected, who have vowed to legislate the hell out of everything from day one, and they're already doing it. This is an incredibly powerful technique. Big organising is what it's called, and it turns out to be applicable to almost any situation. We're already refining and refining the model, and everyone who uses it, after <coughs> the Corbyn campaign, Corbyn people went over to America to explain how they'd refined the model, how they'd improved it. It's getting better all the time. And it is my contention, ladies and gentlemen, that when we put this big organising technique together with the politics of belonging that I'm discussing, with those steps for creating geographical community, political community, economic community, as well as this proliferating community of volunteers actually organising and running campaigns, at that point, my friends, we become unstoppable. 